Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video I have my Game Week 33 team selection, I've got two free transfers and I'm free hitting in Game Week 34, therefore I will be using two free transfers in 33 and today we'll discuss what the possible combination of transfers might be. If you do enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button and if you're new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, before we take a look at my team for Game Week 33, my possible transfer plans, I did just want to discuss that Double Game Week 37 has been officially announced by the Premier League and is now on the FPL site as well. We knew which fixtures would be going into 37 because that was the only free midweek now for most of the teams. But it's still good to get that official confirmation for those that were worrying. So these are the six teams that will be doubling in 37. Brighton, Chelsea, Man City, Man United, Newcastle and Spurs. You can see the fixtures on your screen. A couple of things to note before we move on to my team. First, you Obviously, Chelsea and Spurs have a double-double. So they double in 35 and they double in 37. If we are looking overall at the fixtures across that period, both in the doubles and outside, I would say that Chelsea's fixtures are probably a bit stronger than Spurs. And especially in 37, if you look at them together... I do prefer the fixtures for Chelsea. But if we're looking at the best fixture of the bunch of all the teams that double in 37, it is that Burnley at home game for Spurs. So I genuinely think Son might be a captaincy shout. And whilst, no, we're not expecting clean sheets against City... A uh, Spurs defender against Burnley at home, you'd be pretty happy that playing them even if they had a single. And then I guess the Man City fixture is an additional bonus. They might get you an attacking return or maybe it could be a KG nil-nil. So I wouldn't overlook Spurs, despite the fact they do have some difficult fixtures, because they have a really nice one in 37. They play against Sheffield United in 38, so you definitely can still invest. So Chelsea and Spurs, probably worth it for the double-double. The other notable thing, we just spoke about clean sheets. I look at these fixtures here. And there will be clean sheets, I'm sure. Maybe not that many, but there will be clean sheets. But trying to predict where they fall isn't going to be easy because you look at Chelsea's fixtures, maybe slightly better than some of the others, but Brighton are a decent attack. Forrest can score, especially if that's at the city ground. Both of those are away for Chelsea. They've not defended fairly well. Brighton have been defending well, but Newcastle and Chelsea, I don't think look like clean sheet fixtures. Even for Man City, Fulham at Craven Cottage and then Spurs away, they don't look like clean sheet fixtures. Man United definitely don't. I mean, Arsenal and Newcastle are really rubbish from a clean sheet perspective. Maybe Newcastle against Brighton at home, maybe against a, a Man United team that can sometimes struggle, potentially. But like I said, I think it is probably just that Spurs fixture that I look at and say there's a good chance for a clean sheet. But even Spurs do often concede some pretty silly goals. So this is my issue with, I'll discuss a bit later in this video, I'm looking at a potential bench boost 35 when the likes of Newcastle playing against Sheffield United, Man United playing against Burnley at home. I'm looking at that and thinking... Yes, I'll have less fixtures because I won't have any doublers on my bench, but the fixtures just look so much better. At the moment, I'm looking at bench boosting with maybe Onana in 37 against Arsenal and Newcastle. Not expecting clean sheets. Maybe some save points. Probably Van Heck against Newcastle and Chelsea. Probably just appearance points. Maybe an attacking return. But at that point, I'm looking at maybe eight or nine points between them. I then might end up having maybe a Newcastle defender such as a Dan Byrne on my bench. But again, these are two teams in Brighton United that I think can score goals. So... Obviously, you'd then have an attacker on the bench as well who might make up the points, but I don't really love bench boost 37, and this isn't a surprise, right? We've known the fixtures for a while, and that's why I am starting to look at a potential bench boost 35. And if your team is in a position right now to set up for a bench boost 34, I do also prefer bench boost 34 in isolation when you take a look at the fixtures. So if you're only a few transfers away from getting a good bench in 34, maybe you go there. So... It's nice to get that official confirmation on the fixtures. Definitely the teams that I'm looking at right now looking at this is probably Spurs because I just like that Burnley fixture. Obviously, Chelsea look good too. I'd like to have a couple of Man City, maybe a Foden and potentially a defender, but Foden and Harling look very, very good. And then Newcastle. I think Newcastle's fixtures across this spell are probably slightly better than Manchester United's. So I'd be slightly more interested in Newcastle than Man United assets. I would love to know down below in the comments, based on your current transfer plans, how many double game meet players do you think you'll have for 37? And are you playing your bench boost? So guys, moving on to my team at four game week 33, I'm currently lining up in a 3-4-3 with 1 million in the bank. So a little bit of flexibility there. And I have two free transfers. And as I've said for a little while now, because I'm free hitting in 34, I need to use both of my free transfers in 33. Because what happens when you play the free hit is it essentially wipes out all of your free transfers that you might have stacked. And you will go into the next game week with only the one free transfer. So regardless of what I do with my transfers this week, I will go into game week 35, the other side of my free hit, with only the one transfer. And therefore, I need to use both of them if I don't want to burn a transfer. And what burning a transfer essentially means is you're not utilizing that transfer. So if I only used one this week, I would have one spare this week. 
but then I wouldn't be able to obviously roll that into 35. So I'd still have one in 35. If you're not following, basically I need to use both of my transfers this week in an ideal world. The issue I suppose that I have, and a lot of people on my, on my strategy also have, is we're actually very happy with our team for this week. And we don't really need the two transfers this week. What we need the two transfers for is 35. So in an ideal world, we would have two, two free transfers the other side of the free hit when we can remove some of our Arsenal assets, bring in the likes of Newcastle and Man United, whereas we don't necessarily want to do that right now. Like, I don't want to lose Raya and Saka this week, but going into 35, I'd feel a little bit better doing that. So it's this, this conversation to be had around do you maybe burn a transfer? And I think the answer to that is probably no, because they are valuable and we need to start building for the back end of the season. But then you are maybe making your team weaker this week in an attempt to make it stronger from 35 onwards. So it will make a little bit more sense as we get onto my potential transfer plans, because there aren't many of my transfer plans this week that I think massively improve my team at the moment, but they will do for 35 onwards. My team is currently rated at 95% according to Fantasy Football Hub, so still in a pretty good spot and predicted to get 70.7 .7 points, which is one of the highest I've seen in a long time. I don't think my team looks that great for this week. Maybe Haaland captain is the one that's carrying that. And we'll actually discuss a bit later. I'm not even set on Haaland captain, but we'll start with the goalkeeper situation. I don't like it at all. I was really, really happy with my Petrovic and Raya combo, and they've done me quite well so far, right? Raya's got back-to-back -back clean sheets for me. Actually, Petrovic has been a bit stinky, but I've been playing Raya in the last couple, and he has done fairly well. The issue that I've got is, longer term, I don't want to own Raya. He doesn't have any remaining double game weeks other than 34, and I'm free-hitting in 34, and the fixtures from 35 onwards aren't great. They play Spurs away in 35, Man United away in 37, and yes, he has good fixtures in 36 and 38, but I need to build towards this bench boost. So Raya, I do not want to own from 35 onwards particularly, and especially for 37. And Petrovic just hasn't been particularly good. Chelsea have been conceding goals. They conceded two against Burnley, two against Sheffield United, and therefore I'm not particularly confident in a clean sheet ever. And I've already got Gusto. I don't really want to ever double up on the Chelsea defence. Whereas with Petrovic, I do kind of want to keep him long term though, because Chelsea have this double-double that we spoke about in 35 and 37. So the keeper that I want to keep long-term, I don't want to own. And the keeper that I don't want long-term, I kind of do want to own. So I'm in this position where probably in an ideal world, if I was wildcarding now or in 35, I probably wouldn't have Raya or Petrovic. But just based on the fact that he does have two upcoming double game weeks, I feel like I've kind of got to keep Petrovic. There is some concern around, is he going to keep his place, right? Sanchez is pretty much back uh, fully fit now. I don't think he's quite there, but he's very, very close. And if Petrovic continues to make mistakes... Is there a chance that Sanchez gets given a game? Potentially. But I feel like I need to wait for that to happen. If it does happen and Sanchez comes in, I'll deal with that when it happens and I might have to take a hit. But I don't really want to preempt that. I don't want to guess that I think Sanchez might take his place if Petrovic might keep his place. So Petrovic will be staying for the time being, but I am aware it could become an issue in the future, which leaves David Raya for me. I don't think this is a great chance for a clean sheet against Villa. I think they're one of the better attacks in the league. Watkins is still in absolutely unbelievable form. And therefore, I don't really hate the idea of selling Raya this week. I know some people will, but we spoke about this in the game preview video. Raya doesn't make many saves. So if Raya keeps a clean sheet, I'm probably losing. And, the, and let's say I start Petrovic instead. I'm probably losing four points. And no, that's not ideal. I'd rather not lose it. But I don't feel like... An, in before he probably saves a penalty and makes like 12 saves. I don't feel like I'm selling a player that has whole potential in Raya. So yes, I might lose a few points, but it does set me up better for the future and then I'm not burning a transfer. So I think there is a very good possibility this week, unless I have loads of other issues to deal with, that one of my free transfers is selling Raya and bringing in a double game week keeper in 37. And the most likely option there is Onana. Yes, I am fully aware. I've just said that I'm selling the keeper for the best defense in the league for the keeper as probably the worst defense in the league at the moment in Manchester United. But it sets me up well for the future. And Onana makes so many saves that he can get four or five points without even keeping a clean sheet. So I don't think he's that far behind Raya in terms of a goalkeeper in FPL. Let me know down below what you think of that. But there is a chance that Raya to Onana does happen for me this week. Moving on to the defence, I've also got issues in the defence though. Gusto missed out obviously due to sickness in game week 32, but I think he'll be available for game week 33. He's not even flagged in FPL and Everton at home isn't a bad fixture for him. Given that he's had his rest now, I do expect Gusto to start unless we get any new information. So Gusto, I'm very, very happy to have. Longer term could provide an issue, as I said, Petrovic could as well, but I will deal with that as and when it happens. I've only recently bought Van Heck in, and I actually had game week 33 in mind. I brought him in knowing that he's got a decent fixture this week. Again, Burnley have been attacking fairly well, but Brighton have defended well this season, especially over the last six to eight game weeks. So I am very happy playing Van Heck this week. 
I'm not expecting a massive score, but could he get me a clean sheet? He absolutely could. And when I've got other issues to deal with, having a cheap defender that doubles in 37 feels really nice. So Gusto Van Heck, I'm very happy with. And the other defender I am happy with is you doggy. Pedro Porro obviously outscored him by nine points in game week 32, which was very painful. But Pedro Porro is a brilliant option, but he's also a lot more expensive. So do I think Udoggy's as good as Poro? No. Do I still think he could be worth the saving? Yes, because he's still popping up in the right areas. And he was a little bit unlucky in game week 31 not to get a goal. So I don't hate the idea of having your doggy over Poro, but I suppose if I had unlimited funds, I probably would have Poro in there. But Gusto Van Heck and Udoggy all double in 37, and they're all fit and available as far as I'm aware. So they will probably be staying for me. We've then got eight Nuri and Bradley, and both of these could be issues for me. With eight Nuri, if he's fit and available, I'll keep him because I'd probably start him this week. And in the weeks that I want him, game week 35, Luton at home and game week 37, Crystal Palace at home. Eight Nuri's got really nice fixtures. He's got the attacking threat. He looks fairly nailed. I have absolutely no issue with having eight Nuri in my team. So he's not a player that I feel the need to rush out. If I have to bench boost in either 35 or 37 with eight Nuri against Luton at home or Palace at home, I'm so fine doing that. Because like I said, the doubles in 37 don't screen clean sheets to me. So Aitneri will be staying for me unless it's a long-term injury. Even if he's out for this week, if we, if we can confirm it's only a short-term thing, I may even try and keep him ahead of that Luton at home game in 35. But if it looks like it could be two, three, four weeks and we don't really have a definitive update, then I probably would look to sell him. So unfortunately, I don't have an update at the time of me recording this, but it will be based about, upon how long he's out for. The update that we got immediately after the game with Gary O'Neill is that it wasn't a particularly serious injury. So let's go on the basis that Aiton Yuri is either available this week or 35. I'm not really planning to sell him, which moves on to my most likely transfer this week, which is actually selling Bradley. Now, I'm recording this on Wednesday evening for a Thursday morning upload, but obviously Liverpool do play in on Thursday in Europe against Atalanta. Let's see how many minutes Bradley gets, but more importantly, let's see how many minutes Trent gets and if he's in the squad because Trent is now back in full team training along with Diogo Jota and Allison. So lots of Liverpool assets are starting to become rotation risks. And my concern would be Bradley might start against Atalanta. If Trent's in the squad and gets some minutes, could Trent start against Crystal Palace? He absolutely could. And you have to remember that I'm free hitting in 34. So yes, this week, if Bradley starts and gets 60, He's arguably better than all of my other defenders, but there is a chance that he doesn't start. There's also a chance he starts but doesn't get 60. And then even if he does start and get 60, he's not been particularly great recently anyway, and I'd want to sell him from 35 onwards. So for me, I would say the most likely transfer in my team is to sell Bradley. In the section after we've looked at my team, I'll show, I'll show you my possible transfer plans and the players that I may be looking at bringing in for Bradley. But Bradley is a very likely transfer out for me because it sets me up for the future, and I don't think his minutes are fully secure against Palace. Let's see. If he gets a rest against Atalanta and Gomez plays right back or something and Trent's not in the squad, it probably looks much more likely that Bradley will start, but I still feel like I might end up selling him anyway. So there we go. On the defence, basically, the way that it's looking is unless eight Nuri's out for long term, Gusto Van Heck, eight Nuri, Udogi Petrovic will not be sold. It's just Raya and Bradley. And whilst they've both got home fixtures this week and they are both very good assets, selling Raya and Bradley just sets me up so well for the future that at the moment... That's probably my most likely two free transfers. And like I said, I'll discuss in the next section who's going to be coming in for those two. Let's now move on to the midfield. So moving on to my midfield, it's fairly easy for me this week because four of the players will just not be sold. Palmer and Son have the double-double that we've spoken about and actually really good fixtures this week. I would argue that Son is a potential captaincy shout and you could even argue that Palmer is as well. So Palmer and Son absolutely love them because I'm on a strategy where I've already used my wild card and I'm free hitting in 34. So some people have the debate around whether you sell Palmer or Son ahead of 34. For me, I don't have that issue because I have the free hit. Salah is Salah. I want to at least keep him for 33. And to be honest... I haven't made a single plan where I actually sell Salah because I don't need to based on my current transfer plans for the rest of the season. And also I've got decent enough value. Yes, I could sell him in 37 to bring in a doubler, but I'm not sure that I will because I don't necessarily buy that any, if many doublers will outscore Salah. I know he's got Villa away, which isn't a great fixture, but anyway, there's a good chance that I don't even sell him in 37, but definitely not for the next few weeks. And I actually think that a lot of people wildcarding in 35 will sell Salah and therefore it's kind of a bit of a differential against those that wildcard because they'll be slightly ahead of me their teams will look better than mine in 35 but if I have Salah and Salah continues to pop off as we know he has in the past that could be a really nice differential so for me Salah will not be sold at least for the next two or three game weeks regarding whether Salah's a captaincy shout I'm leaning more and more towards yes and I've actually just tested how I feel with it on him. And it feels pretty good. We've seen him in the past do quite well against Crystal Palace. But what I love about Salah, we'll discuss Haaland in a second. 
I feel like his minutes should be fairly secure. Let's see again how many minutes he gets in Europe on Thursday. But his minutes should be fairly secure. It's at home. We know he's very, very good at Anfield. And I do feel like his underlying data has been very, very strong since coming back from injury. I know he's got a little bit lucky with a couple of pens. But I also just do feel like Salah is a very good FP option at the moment. So I'm leaning towards... I'm not, I wouldn't say that Salah's ahead of Haaland for me, but if we have any doubts around Haaland's minutes, I might just risk it on Salah. I know it is a big risk because Haaland against Luton, if he does start, could be exceptional. But there is some temptation for me to captain Salah. I'd love to know down below, is anyone else tempted to go against Erling Haaland? And then Garnacho is not going to be sold for me. I actually am really happy. I mean, I was going back and forth between Garnacho and Gordon because I could have afforded Gordon, but I wanted to keep a little bit of money in the bank, which I'm very glad I've done now because I kind of need that money. And also, I just thought Garnacho was really, really good. I'm a Man United fan. I watch him every week. And he's getting into better and better goal-scoring positions. And he just looks dangerous against every single team. Could have scored against Liverpool. Obviously, got the two goals against Chelsea. He's now got Bournemouth away. And what I love about Garnacho and my team at the moment is it feels like I've got a very strong first sub every week. If I need him, I feel like I can call him. And I certainly don't mind having him coming off the bench. Sometimes you've got a bench and you're just like, please, no one miss out from my starting eleven because I don't want to rely on my bench. Garnacho feels like a player... If one of my starting 11 attackers miss out, I'm actually kind of excited because I'm like, oh, I get Garnacho off the bench. So this week, there could genuinely be rotation, right? Haaland could be rested. Saka could be rested. And if that's the case and they don't come on, I'm really happy having Garnacho. The one midfielder that I've not discussed is Bakayo Saka because he's the only midfielder that I would be tempted to sell. And I know that sounds crazy because he's been so good he is fantastic. He's on penalties. Arsenal, one of the best attacks in the league. It's a home fixture against a Villa team that have been leaking goals. It seems crazy. And even as I'm saying it, I'm like, why am I looking to sell him? But I suppose my concern with Saka is, again, he's not a player that I want to own from 35 onwards anyway. So in 35, there's a very good chance I'd sell him even if I don't sell him this week. And on top of that, his minutes have just been not, they've just not been very good at the moment. He's getting like 60 to 70 minutes on average. We spoke about this in the preview video. I think he's averaging about 65, 70 minutes over the last six. So he's not a 90 minute man. And therefore, if they get a penalty in the final 20, 25 minutes, it won't be him taking it. It'll probably be Erdegaard. And so when you strip 25, 30 minutes off of Saka, his date all of a sudden looks nowhere near as good. And I just wonder, is he the same option if he's not getting close to 90 minutes every single week? And he obviously then got 90 minutes against Bayern Munich. Actually, more than 90 minutes if he went into extra time. He was limping around a lot. Well, to be honest, I just think Saka just limps a lot. I think that's what he does when he walks around the pitch. I'm not saying he's faking it, but he just spends his whole time limping. So I'm not suggesting that I think Saka's badly injured. But do I think there's a chance that Saka gets benched? I think there's a small chance. I still would predict that he starts. But then when he starts, he's not getting enough minutes. So for me, I look at this and think, could I bet against 60 minutes of Saka to bring in another option for him? I think the answer to that question is yes. The concern that I've got is that the player that I would want to bring in is Phil Foden. And is Phil Foden going to get more minutes than Saka? Probably not. There's, I mean, I think there's more of a chance of Foden being benched than Saka, but I do also think that Foden could start. So I guess it's like, yes, Saka for 60 minutes against Villa at home, I don't think is like game breaking. I don't think I'd be hugely punished unless I got very unlucky. But when the player that I'm bringing in, his minutes aren't overly secure, it doesn't feel like the best transfer. The other option that I'd have is bringing in Gordon. Spurs at home. Spurs aren't the best defense and Gordon is better at home. But then even if Gordon gets 90, it's not a fixture that I'm like, I desperately want to bring in Gordon ahead of Spurs at home instead of Saka against Villa at home. So I, I am still open to selling Saka. And I think if we get a leak that Foden starts, I think there's a very good chance that I would sell Saka for Foden. But if we don't get that leak, I'm finding it more and more difficult to do because like I said, I could end up doing what people did last week, which is selling a Saka that starts for a Foden that's on the bench. So I think I am going to be reliant on leaks as to whether I sell Saka this week, but I'm not against it given his minutes recently. And also his data has dropped off a cliff. His expected goal is really, really poor. His creativity is still there, but he's just not getting the same chances. So I'll leave it there with the midfield. Parmesan, Salagarnacha will not be sold. There's a small chance of Saka to Foden and an even smaller chance of Saka to Gordon. Let's now move on to the three forwards. So moving on to the three forwards, we have Erling Haaland, Isaac and Darwin all at home this week. They're all away from home last week. And I'm perfectly happy with all of them, to be honest. If I had one free transfer, I would be rolling with my team most likely this week. But obviously I've got the two and not only do I have two, but I have to use both of them. So I'm looking at one of my forwards that potentially being sold, which is Darwin. Just very briefly on Haaland and Isaac, no need for me to sell them. And even if we got a leak that Haaland was on the bench, because City play at 3 p.m. on Saturday, so there is a chance we get a leak. Even if we got a leak or even if there were murder that made me think that he wasn't going to start. 
I still think that I would probably, if right, if we get a lick that he doesn't start, I would bench him and play Garnacho. If we're just unsure and we think there's a chance that he might not start, I'd probably just switch the captaincy to Salah and just start Haaland regardless. I wouldn't ever sell Haaland in, with my strategy unless we get a leak that he's injured long-term or something like that, right? Because I don't have a wild card to play. So I would then have to bring Haaland back in in 35 after the free hit. And I've got other transfers that I want to make. I don't think it's a good use of two transfers to sell Haaland to buy Haaland back. If you're on wild card 35 and potentially you're not free hitting 34, selling Haaland if we get a leak that he doesn't start could be a really, really nice plan. Or if you just don't think that he starts yourself. But for me, he won't be sold. It will just be about, do I start and bench him? And do I give him the armband? I would love to know down below in the comments, as of when you watch this on Thursday, what do you think Haaland's chances are of starting? I will just say, even if he starts, I don't think he gets more than 65, 70 minutes, unless they are really struggling against Luton. But you wouldn't imagine that City will be struggling against Luton. I just don't see the need to play him for 90 minutes ahead of that second leg against Real Madrid. So if we say, let's say that he's hypothetically Haaland starts and we get information that he does, would you prefer Haaland for 65 to 70 minutes against Luton at home or Salah for a projected probably 90 minutes? I think that one's a lot closer. And it's when it's therefore why I think captaincy is a bit of a discussion to be had this week. On Isaac, I don't think this is a perfect fixture. Actually, Spurs have been defending slightly better at the moment. They're sort of, I think they're fourth for expected goals conceded over the last six. So they are defending slightly better. But we know that Newcastle are better at home. Isaac's better at home. He's on penalties. His date has been good. I have absolutely no issues with starting Isaac this week. And it's why I've got you doggy third sub. Because I do think that Isaac, not necessarily Isaac scores, but I think that Newcastle will get a goal or two in this game. So fine having Isaac. And then from 35 onwards, he's got Sheffield United, Burnley, double game week Brentford. It's a really nice end to the season for Newcastle. And I think most people will be looking at a triple up. Therefore, the only player in my front three, my front three, get your words out, Raptor, that I could sell is Darwin against Crystal Palace at home. I think Darwin will start this, but let's say that he does get 90 minutes and there are some doubts around whether, sorry, he gets 90 minutes in Europe and there are some doubts around whether he starts in the league. Maybe it would push me towards selling him, but I don't necessarily think this is the best time to sell him because most of the other options I would be looking at either have issues with yellow cards, which would be a Jackson if I decide to free up my third Chelsea spot. Hoyland, who I don't think has the best fixture this week against Bournemouth. I could go for Cunha, but his minutes haven't been very secure recently after coming back from injury. So most of the other options that I could move to for Darwin, I don't think it's the best entry point. And I do think Darwin at home against anyone is a seriously good FPL option. So I don't love the idea of selling him. But if I was to sell him, I think probably Rasmus Hoyland makes the most sense. I would then arguably maybe just start Garnacho. I think Garnacho is a better option than Hoyland at the moment. So it'd be Darwin to Hoyland, benched, and then I'd start Garnacho in a 3-5-2. It does get me ahead on transfers. Again, from 35 onwards, I don't want to own Darwin. But I don't love the idea of selling him this week if I think there's a good chance he starts. So as you can see, based on my current transfer plans, it's basically Arsenal and Liverpool are the assets that I'd like to remove either now or soon. Because I'm free-hitting 34... And because their fixtures are pretty rough from 35 onwards and they don't double in 37, of course, I kind of feel like they're the ones that I need to start slowly moving out. So I do think that Raya, Saka, Bradley and Darwin, the two Arsenal and two Liverpool outside of, of course, Mohamed Salah, they are the most likely to be sold for me this week. But it doesn't feel great, again, given that they have two home fixtures against Villa and Crystal Palace. So that is the team. Like I said, two transfers need to be used. So whilst I've gone through it each position by position now, let's take a look at, in totality, what are the potential transfers that I might make and which is the best combination for my current team. So guys, I spoke about most of these in the team selection part of the video, so I don't want to repeat myself too much. I'll fly through this and then I want to show you what my team looks like from 35 onwards because I'm very tempted by a bench boost 35 and I would love your opinion down below and if you think it is viable. Obviously, I don't need to decide till 35, but I do think my transfers this week might shape whether I really want to try and attack that 35 bench boost. They probably will be very similar, but it might mean that I go in one direction slightly more than the other. So very briefly, Riot Onana is going to happen at some point for me. I know United aren't good defensively, but Onana makes so many saves. We spoke about this in the game preview video that I still think he's a very good option. And I'd probably start Onana this week to avoid me having to double up on the Chelsea defence. In defence... Bradley and Aitneary are the only two that could be sold for me, unless we get news on the others that makes me want to sell them. It's more likely to be Bradley. And out of the two options that I'm considering, Branthwaite and Byrne, Dan Byrne is the most likely one. 
So Bradley to Dan Byrne at the moment is penciled in as a very likely transfer for me in 33. Unless Trent re-aggravates his injury and is out for the season, then I might have to rethink because Bradley's such great value. But Bradley to Byrne just sets me really well up for game week 35 onwards. And then if I want to sell Eaton Uri for whatever reason, I'd probably have to go for Branthwaite as well as doing Bradley to Byrne. In midfield, Saka to Foden... If we get some sort of leak or information that we think Foden starts and maybe we feel like Saka might not or his minutes will be reduced, Saka to Foden is a move that I'd like to make at some point. Why not make it ahead of Luton at home? And then Gordon could be a good backup. Let's say we get news that Saka's unavailable, but we're a bit unsure on Foden. Saka to Gordon is a move that also sets me well up for the future as well. And then up front, Darwin to Hoyland will be my most likely transfer. I will just say most of these transfers will probably happen anyway. It's just about what two I do this week. For example, let's say I do Raya to Onana this week and Bradley to Burn this week. Well, in the future, I'm still going to want to do Saka to Foden and Darwin to Hoyland. It would just be in 35 and 36, right? So I think apart from the eight Nuri transfer, all of these will happen based on what I currently know. It's just about the priority of them and in which weeks I do them. So with that being said, those are my possible game at 33 transfers. I think if you were to push me right now, the most likely two would be Raya to Onana and Bradley to Burn. So let's take a look at how my team looks if I make those transfers and why I am so very tempted by a bench boost 35. So guys, moving over to Fantasy Football Hub to just show you what my team might look like for the remainder of the season now that we've had all of these fixtures confirmed and they are now on Fantasy Football Hub as well. This is the way that the team would look if I make those two planned transfers. I think I would have Onana against Bournemouth away rather than Petrovic against Everton at home. But that's something to think about because I think in isolation, Petrovic is probably a better option. But it's more so that I think Gusto will start and he's in my team. And I'm not sure I want to go double in on that Chelsea defence. United aren't much better, actually. They're much worse, to be honest, than Chelsea. But it kind of feels like Onana at least makes a lot of saves. And you just never know. It's more diversifying and hedging my bets. But I'll make that decision as and when. This would be the way the team would look. Burn would come in, but he would just go third sub for me. So in 34, I would be free hitting. So completely ignore all this. Obviously, next week, there'll be lots of free hit 34 content as well as the normal content as well. So in 35, this is the way that the team would be lining up with one free transfer and 0.8 in the bank. So I've currently got three Chelsea, Petrovic, Gusto, Palmer. I've got Udogi and Son. Eight Nuri against Luton at home, Salah against West Ham, Saka against Spurs if I don't make the Foden move, of course. Garnacho against Burnley, Haaland against Forest, Isaac against Sheffield United in the starting 11. But then I looked at it, and on the bench, I've currently got Onana against Burnley at home, Darwin against West Ham away, Burn against Sheffield United at home, and Van Heck against Bournemouth away. So I looked at this, and then I thought, actually, that without any transfers could be a bench boost. Now, if I'm dealt random injuries that happen in 34 and it's just not possible, absolutely fine. I'll just still save it for 37. But with the one free transfer, I could go a few different ways with this. I could replace Saka with someone like Madison or Richarlison and get me my third Spurs or sixth double game week player for 35. Alternatively, I could potentially, if I'm now not bench boosting in 37, I could remove Van Heck, who I know I've just brought in. But if I want to improve Van Heck because... Bournemouth away, you would say Van Heck is probably the weakest player out of everyone in this team at the moment for game week 35. So I could remove Van Heck if I wanted to, or I could do that Darwin to Hoyland move, which would give me Hoyland against Burnley at home as the player that's probably on my bench boost. You could even argue that Saka would drop to the bench and be on my bench boost instead. But then I'd be looking at Onara against Burnley at home, Darwin against Burnley at home, Burn against Sheffield United at home, and then Van Heck against Bournemouth away. No, it's not a double game week bench, but it is a very strong one. So let's say that that is the move. What do you think of that bench boost down below? Do you like it or am I, have I gone completely bonkers just playing it in 37? So let me make that transfer. That would be my one free transfer in 35. I obviously wouldn't have three Spurs, but it's not the end of the world. Going into 36, let me optimize the team here. So this is the way I would currently be lining up again with one free transfer. I think... I think anyway, the rough plan would probably be to roll here. It's not ideal. I mean, again, I'd probably play Onana, to be perfectly honest, instead of Petrovic, because I'm obviously having to play Gusto against West Ham away, West Ham at home, not a great chance for a clean sheet. Van Heck against Villa at home. I've obviously got Sonny against Liverpool. I've actually still got Saka at this point against Bournemouth at home, which is probably going to be a nice differential. So I don't think my team looks the strongest for this week, but that's fine because it's not going to look perfect every single week. Then going into 37, let's say I try to not use a transfer. This was the way that the team would currently look. And again, let me click the optimize button to just place roughly what my starting 11 would look like. I would have, do you know what? I, I probably would end up replacing Saka at this point, having 
Salah on the bench. So I think my two transfers would be something like, now I would probably look to bring in Foden. If it's not Foden, it would be Madison or Gordon. But let's say it's Foden, because I think that's most likely. Foden comes in now at this stage. Then I would have one more free transfer. And I've got a few different ways that I can do this. I could replace one of my other double gaming players that I don't think is particularly great for this week. For example, and sorry to keep being harsh on him, but Van Heck to like a Fabian share is probably a bit of an upgrade. Or I do look to replace Eight Nuri against Crystal Palace at home. So it could be Eight Nuri to Fabian share is a decent option, which would probably mean that Van Heck then drops to my bench. Let me make those transfers. If it's something like that, it would probably be that they've done it like that. I, I would probably bring Fabian Scher in for Van Heck personally. And then, so yeah, the bench boost would essentially be Onana with a double, Salah with Villa away, Burn with a double, and Van Heck with a double. I just think if you look at all of their doubles, they're not that great. But I suppose that's probably on paper a better bench boost. If you're looking at projected points anyway, it is just generally a better bench boost. So the, the first and main question I want to ask you here, would you prefer Onana, Salah, Burn, Van Heck with three extra fixtures, do you know what? I'm looking at this and probably thinking it is slightly better to go in 37. Or Onana, Hoyland, Burn and Van Heck with better fixtures, but obviously three less. My other concern with 37 is probably in isolation that is a better bench, but could there be rotation? Are we absolutely sure that everyone on our bench would play both games in the double? I think with Bur Burn, Van Heck and Onana, probably. They probably would. So maybe rotation's not as much of an issue here. I don't think my transfer structure and plans will drastically change if I choose to bench boost in 35 or 37. So it's not really a decision I need to make now. And then going into 38, I would have one free transfer. And this is the way the team would currently look. Let me optimize because Salah would come back into the 11. I think my transfer would likely be bringing Saka back in or make it maybe just taking a one-week punt on someone else. But the team is looking very, very strong. I would probably have Fabian Scher. I don't know why they hate Fabian Scher so much over at Fantasy Football Hub because his projected points are quite low. But... I'd probably play Fabian Scher there ahead of Van Heck. And the team's already looking very strong. And it would just be about adapting to last minute news in Game Week 38. So that's the rough plan. I think the key thing for me is deciding when the bench boot is played. I think injuries might make the decision for me. If I get a couple of injuries in 35, there's just no way to play the bench boost. Equally, if I don't get injuries and I just don't want to bench the players that I've currently got, it might be that I just go in a slightly suboptimal week and just hope that the players in 35 do something for me. So I hope that Man United beat Burnley at home like 3-0. Hopefully Burn keeps a clean sheet and you never know what Van Heck might get. I could just get lucky and get like 20, 25 points. So there we go. Love to, love to know down below what you think of Bench Boost 35, what you think of my overall transfer plans. And if you had my current team going into game week 33... Let me just go back to it for you. Which of these two would you make? Or would you maybe burn a transfer? Some people would burn it, but let's say we don't want to burn. Which of the two transfers would you make this week? So guys, I thought I would update you on how I'm getting on with my new job as a football manager for South London United. And if you've got absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, and this is the first you've heard of it, I will link down below at the top of the description my announcement of how I'm becoming a football manager and what this actually entails and how you can support me. So if you've enjoyed my content over the years and you have no idea what I'm talking about yet, please spend five minutes watching the video down below where you can understand how you can support my journey as a football manager for South London United. But just as an update, we did lose the game in round one. But as I said, it was against Paris FC, who are one of the best teams in the league, arguably the best team in the league. And it was very close. We only lost 1-0. And I'll flash up on screen. You can see that the XG, pass completion, shots on target sort of statistics are very, very similar for the two teams. They just took one of their chances and we didn't. But we did defend very well, which I'm very happy about. But we could have created more chances. And that seems to be the issue with us. So I'm going to keep tweaking the tactics until we start scoring more goals. But I'm not going to overreact to that first first game because like I said it was a very very difficult opposition but sadly round two is against another very top team which is Angelinos they actually lost their first game of the season though so both of us need to get points on the board so this will be very interesting this is an away game in LA so maybe a little bit more difficult than a home game would be but I am still optimistic. I just want to say very quickly, lots of you signed up to One Future Football, which I cannot thank you enough for, but also lots of you forgot to support South London United. So when you go onto One Future Football and you've signed up, top right corner of the screen, go to dashboard, and then you actually have to select to support South London United because lots of you have just signed up and not selected your club, which I do appreciate, but please make sure you select South London as your club to support. And we actually already have some top fans that have spent lots of their points training, which I'm going to discuss in the next section, but Canav, Horan 2000, 
2003, Super Pyro 44, Gadji, Swino, Msete, Graz Dodge, Trez, and Genomac. Thank you so much for spending your points to train the players. I really, really do appreciate it. And as I said, I'll discuss that in a second. But regarding the team that I'm going to take into round two, I'm not really going to change anything because I could overreact to this 1-0 loss, right? I actually feel like a proper football manager here. I could overreact to this 1-0 loss, but I, I feel like I shouldn't because it was a very difficult opposition. We still created chances. We defended fairly well. And I need to see how this team gets on with the tactics and the personnel over a slightly longer period of time before I start tweaking because it could have just been a one-off game. If we win this game 3 or 4-0, then I know I might be along the right line. So I'm probably going to keep this rough starting 11 and tactical setup for the next three or four games. But if we are struggling to create, one of my ideas is bringing Grondon into the center of the pitch because he is a central attacking midfielder that can play on the right. Imagine like a Bruno Fernandes or a one matter at Manchester United. They are primarily a central midfielder or a central attacking midfielder, but they can play out on the right. So maybe Grondon coming in through the center would make our team a little bit more creative, but I'll decide that in the near future based on how we get on in the next few games. So that is how we got on in round one. Round two is a pretty difficult game against Angelinos, but I'm hopeful that we can pick up some points. I now just want to very briefly show you how we can support even further once you've selected South London as your club by training some of my players. So guys, when you go over to One Future Football, this is the screen that you'll see when you load in. As I said, in the top right corner of the screen, which you can't see, you can click on sort of your profile and then dashboard comes up as an option. When you go onto dashboard, it will take you to a few different things. Firstly, where you can claim your daily gift and your daily gift can be player cards, which is how you eventually train people and also points, which you can use to then train the cards that you own. You can also see this is where you would select which club you support. I already support South London because I've been using One Future Football and engaging with this for about eight or nine months actually. So I'm actually an elite member of South London whilst also being the manager of the club. But this is where you can select which pl which club you'd like to support. And then also this is where you can either buy player cards if you, if you don't already own one, but you don't have to buy cards, by the way. You can get them through the free fantasy game for One Future Football. You can get them when you sign up, by the way. If you signed up using my link, you should have some free cards to open up and look at. So make sure you open those up. And then once you own cards, you can then go on to train players. And once you're on train players, all of the players that you own will come up. Now, I'm encouraging you to only train the players that play for South London United because if you're training the other players, you're basically supporting the opposition. So if you've got any players that play for uh, South London United, and you can find out which players play for them by going to the club and players section of the website, such as the top player there, Hassan Sabri. I own pretty much all of the South London United players because I've either packed them, bought them, or just got them over time with my daily gifts. And I've been using, like I said, One Future Football for a long time. But let's scroll down to someone like, I don't know, Ruben Sinclair. I do have a lot of cards that I own, but obviously I'm only training South London United players now. So Ruben Sinclair, we click on him. The thing that I love about One Future Football is everyone contributes towards the training. So if you train and your friend trains and I train, we can combine to increase sort of the statistics for that player. So imagine it's kind of a bit like FIFA. There's like basically like a hidden rating for each player. If we train that player in that attribute and they reach 100%, that attribute is then upgraded. So as you can see here, I've recently trained with some other people the shooting for Ruben Sinclair. His shooting is now at 100%, which means before the next round, there will be an improvement in Ruben Sinclair's shooting. So if we now combine as sort of a bit of a community and train all of the South London players, that will then affect how well they perform. So you actually do have, which you don't have in many other sort of, I suppose, games here, but it's more than just the game. You don't have the input to try and improve the way the team is performing. Like if you support Man United in real life, you can't really Im improve the way Bruno Fernandes performs, but you can in one future football. So what I'm encouraging you to do, whether you pack them, whether you own them already, whether you get them through the daily gifts, if you have South London players, please train them. So shooting's already at 100%. What you can do is you can click on one of them. Let's click on delivery. You can either train it by 1% using the train button, which is just 50 points. So that will train it up by 1%. Or you can super train, which pushes it to 100%. So for me to super train delivery, it's 3,000 points. I would just say that's a fair amount of points. So don't worry if you can't super train. But if I was to click on super train, I've now super trained Ruben Sinclair's delivery. And as you can see, it says skill upgraded. Ruben Sinclair has been excellent in delivery training. Expect to see skills increase before the next match. So that's it. As well as making sure that you support South London, open up your free player packs that you get when you sign up using my link. You can then also help me by training the players and hopefully we'll get a win in round two of One Future Football. So guys, there you have it. That is my game week 33 team selection video. If you did enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button. And if you're still watching now and you haven't subscribed, please do consider doing so. I'd really, really appreciate it. Until next time, which will be my deadline decisions video tomorrow. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.